Hello, this is your host, Eric Akopian of Polytox, and we are honored to have with us famed world economist Eric Reiner, who is currently on a lecture tour in Armenia. Professor Eric Reiner is a development economist, well known for challenging neoliberal uh, economic orthodoxy, and he's, as far as I know, the only economist who was actually a successful entrepreneur and businessman before entering academia. Uh, welcome to our program, Professor Reiner. Thank you very much. I'm going to start to give an overview of your work. Uh, your most famous work is called How Rich Countries Get Rich and Why Poor Countries Get Poor. Obviously, it's a couple of hundred pages worth of book, but for the purposes of the layman and in short term, what would you say the two or three principles that you would outline from your book that people should know about? Well, I think the basic lesson is that economic activities are qualitatively different. Um, in agriculture and mining, uh, there is always one factor of production which is limited by nature. So you run into diminishing returns. So if you specialize in an agricultural product, you're going to produce that agricultural product in more and more marginal land. And, um, and you're also subject to uh, perfect competition. So this is the reason why even the most efficient farmers in the world, in the United States and the European Union, have to be subsidized. If we ask ourselves that question, we also automatically have a reply why no country ever got rich through agriculture. Then you have the neutral, uh, no-scale effect, uh, like the barbers or, or, or uh, normal service sector. And then you have the increasing return sector. The, service, the sectors where the volume of production, uh, when the volume of production goes up, costs go down. And this is like Henry Ford. <coughs> and Henry Ford could make a lot of money by mechanizing, but he could also double his wages. Uh, the famous $5, five dollars, dollars a day. Five dollars <coughs> a day. So you know, if, we, if we see this difference between economic activities, and, and if you go into neoliberal and neoclassical economics, we find that their trade theory is based on the barter of labor hours, qualitatively identical labor hours. The labor it? arbitrage? And yeah. So, so uh, David Ricardo in 1817 uh, modeled world trade after with the barter of labor hours, and he didn't consider the increasing and diminishing returns effect. So whenever you put increasing and diminishing returns in, uh, you get unequal development. The problem is that that is not compatible with equilibrium, so the economists decided to throw these factors out in order to save equilibrium. I'm throwing out equilibrium in order to save the understanding of uneven development. That means you don't, you get, you don't get a lot of invitations to economic conferences among the neoliberals, do you? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. I, 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 uh, I feel I get uh, called to countries where that are doing very poorly. And, <laughs> and, and uh, according to my wife, Armenia is country number 69 where I've been working. Oh, fantastic. Well, we're very lucky to have you here. One of the questions that before we move on to your uh, intellectual criticism of neoliberal, neoliberal orthodoxy is, I want to ask you, what is the, and I think this might be somewhat related to your ideas, what is the distinction between economic growth and development, i.e. development that uh, is beneficial to ordinary people and improves the lives of ordinary people? Is there such a distinction uh, or not? Well, uh, I don't think it's enough of a, a distinction, but, but clearly economic growth could be more of the same thing. Uh, it could be more, m more stone axes in the Stone Age. Uh, economic development is uh, that you move on to the Bronze Age and, and, and uh, subsequently you, you move on to, to new technologies or new techno-economic paradigms and, and you have qualitative changes. And this is the problem also with, with neoclassical economics that you know, the qualitative changes uh, that accompany economic development are, are not there. So there is not sufficient distinction between growth and development. Well, I mean, you, I mean uh, the reason I bring that up is you see countries like uh, Brazil. I mean, you go to Brazil, you know, advanced highways, uh, advanced airports, uh, you're out five minutes and you see the type of poverty you would see in the worst of third world countries. And if you look at it statistically, outside of the 80s, they've had significant amounts of growth during certain periods. But that has not changed the imbalances in the society or the well-being of the society, uh, except for that short Lula period where uh, 
because of many different, I mean, that's the distinction that I see is people look at these numbers, but growth numbers don't necessarily mean improvement. That, that's right. But, uh, you know, from the 70s of the Brazilian miracle and on through the period of, of Lula, actually, uh, Brazil was, was improving on these points. But then it, 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 it fell back. Uh, so you can say, in, in terms of economic development, uh, compared to the rest of Latin America, Brazil has been uh, out of sync. So, so the deindustrialization that happened in the late 70s in most Spanish-speaking Latin American countries, um, leading to some kind of retrogression, um, that only happened in Brazil 20 years later. And actually in 2004, when, when uh, the EU opened up to the east, uh, my colleague of mine uh, and I wrote a paper about the Latin Americanization of Europe. And, and what we were trying to say was that e with this integration of the poor East and the rich, the rich West North. overnight, instead of Gradually. over a period of saving industry in the East, we will, Europe would become more like, like Latin America. You know, the, the distance between the, the, the uh, the rich and the poor will be shorter, you know, in, 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 in real in in two blocks, right? Yeah. Yeah. In, 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 in Norway, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's uh, a couple of thousand kilometers. And, and in Estonia, perhaps, it's 100 kilometers. But we will, uh, th this is what we, were, what we were foreseeing, you know, and that by just by gravity, if you add uh, a few million people who are happy with one euro an hour to millions of people who are unhappy if they only make 10 euro an hour, you know, that, that had to cause problems and, and it did. And of course, that, this is, we're in the middle of this, I think, the Latin Americanization of Western Europe. Uh, well, let's come to uh, Armenia specifically. Uh, we have a new government in a post-revolutionary period. Uh, an exceptionally popular government, an exceptionally popular leader, uh, who has done certain things that, frankly, regardless of economic systems, is good. Cleaning up corruption, transparency, uh, competition as far as getting rid of monopolies. Those, those are all good under any economic scenario. Uh, but you have, let's say, uh, you're the pr principal economic advisor to him. What are the the three or four things that you would tell him he needs to do over the next four or five years if his intention is to improve, uh, not only have growth, but actually raise living standards uh, over his term, which is, I believe, is four years. Uh, how would you, what steps would you take? Well, I would, uh, first of all, try to see where it's possible to add value to industry. You know, the, the Chileans uh, exported their wine in bulk and then suddenly they prohibited the, the export of wine in bulk and they, they doubled the value of the exports, you know, with the bottles and the labels and the bottling and the corks and all that, right? So if you can add value to your existing uh, export, that's a good idea. And I, I would also uh, recommend to look at the import bill. You know, what is it that you're importing? And where is it with a minimum intervention that you could, you could increase the local production the most? There's one, here Russia has one successful example. They used to import chicken from the United States. They, it was called bush legs, they called it that in Russia. And with a minimum of um, uh, sanitary regulations and minimum of tariffs, they had a tremendous success in creating their own... It's import substitution, essentially. Yeah, poultry. But, but I think you, you, you can't do import substitution, especially if you're a small country, all, all over. But you can look at your Limited import bill and say, where can we do something? Perhaps you can repeat the chicken uh, success of, of, of the Russians. And then the third thing I would look at is, is um, uh, the problems in balance of payments and, and the growing debt. Right? This is a problem you share with your neighbors. Uh, and interestingly here, uh, in, in Germany in the 1930s, one of the words that brought the Nazis to power was the word Zinsknechtschaft, which actually means interest serfdom. That <coughs> Germany was uh, deeper and deeper into debt, and more and more of the GDP had to serve debt. How do you say that in Greek? Uh, 
I, I don't know. <laughs> but in, in, in the United States, could it be interest bonded or oh, yeah. interest oh, served up or something like that? And, and this is what's happening now. And, and the, the, the interesting thing is that the villain now is Germany. You know, German export surplus is, is uh, you see it mirrored here in, 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 um, in trade deficits. So I think here is something uh, that uh, should be done. And in a sense, the euro is what the financial people call a Ponzi scheme, like, like a pyramid game that is going to collapse. And even a big country like Italy is in that situation. I mean, their debt ratio is over 100% now, right? Yeah. But if you tell them now you have to save more, their economy would shrink. This is what, what's called, what Keynes called the paradox of savings. Because if you save more, well, your economy is, 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 is going to diminish. So a lot of countries are in your situation that you should save more, but then your, your, your economy would shrink. But this is a generalized problem. This is something, I think, which, which uh, when we, when we uh, dig Keynes out, out again, which we are slowly going to do, uh, you will see that what Keynes did was create employment, and what Mario Draghi did was to create a lot of money. Uh, I think what, uh, I'm looking at the daily papers, I, I think uh, you might be getting a call from President Erdogan over the next couple of weeks, I think. <laughs> because yeah, maybe, he's yes. going to be in that bind in short order. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to play a little bit of the devil's advocate here. Uh, obviously, I, I, I agree with your economic assessments of the broader uh, ass uh, assessments in bigger countries. However, this is a small country. Uh, it's got uh, access issues. It's on, when it comes to wages, uh, it's high enough that it can't be the lowest and the cheapest, uh, but it's not high enough to be a satisfactory standard of living. So it's sort of like this opposite of a Goldilocks zone. Uh, and uh, when you're trying to solve the problems of two or three million people, in some ways it's easier than to solve the problems of a couple hundred million people. Uh, is it possible to have is it possible that a neoliberal economic system is, is failing everywhere, but can work in anomalous places that are small, unique, and have their own, whether it's the Armenias, the Singapores, and other places like that? Uh, it, uh, do you believe that there could be such an anomaly in a place like Armenia, given many well, different factors? Uh, taking one step back, I think uh, the minimum efficient size of a reasonably self-sufficient country is growing. In the 1930s, uh, Estonia had one million people and it was s heavily industrialized. They could have two bicycle factories and two, fi two factories of this and that. And it was much richer than Finland, uh, surprisingly. <coughs> but now, uh, if you want to be reasonably self-sufficient in, in, in a, in a uh, you need to be a much bigger economy. And uh, the small economies, um, like Norway and Sweden, for, for a long time, in spite of their smallness, each other's best customers. So, so I think a rule is if you find a country with more or less your, self, your, your standard of living and your technological level, you know, the trade with, with these neighbors are always good. Symmetrical trade is always good. Uh, this is what Ungtar called it, symmetrical trade. But there are not that many around. But, but you know, looking at your neighbors and trading with them would be, would, would be a, a good idea. But I think it is possible, as you say, to, to, to uh, survive as, as a small country. But you have, you probably, because you're not as efficient as, and poor as China, uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult to to, to, to compete in manufacturing industry. But I think you have to pick some areas where you, where you uh, produce yourself. You know, if you had kaolin, if you had clay, maybe you could go into tiles. You know, Georgia is going into, want to do that because they have clay. You know, I think you have to, to pick some areas where you can create a comparative advantage. Um, and, and tourism is fine, and this country is, is great for tourism, but, but tourism is a job creator. It's not a wage creator. It's not just a generation of waiters. Yeah. It's a yeah. And, and, and if, if the waiters share their economy with high-tech people, that's, 
that's fine. But, but if, yeah. they, if they share it with farmers, it's it's yeah. it's, it's it's not. That's what you have in Greece. Yeah. So so uh, I think it is possible, but you 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 do have to uh, to concentrate in 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 some sectors. You know, on 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 the local consumption side, like uh, chicken, or on the export side. Well, you have wine and brandy and and and, and other things which which are eminently e exportable. Yeah, I, th I think you're absolutely correct. I mean, I don't think, that by asking the question, I wasn't saying you don't try. No. I'm just saying that uh, sometimes these universal rules are not necessarily workable everywhere. No. No. Uh, context even, matters, yeah, it's so. clearly. Uh, I know you're an expert on uh, post-Soviet economies, which actually few people really understand what really happened in this part of the world for 25, 30 years, and the trauma that it caused, and, or frankly cared, as far as the Western elites go. And my, I have this running joke is that we spent uh, 25 years hoping for Armenia to become like the rest of the world, and now it looks like the rest of the world is becoming what Armenia was, uh, or is trying to get out of. You made an interesting analogy with the, with the revolutions of 1848 and what happened in 2016 in the West, which is the Trump election, Brexit, and other populist movements, uh, and, the, and um, the sort of the elite consensus collapsing and the lack of credibility with the elites. Do you see, is the analogy, am I, am I taking this too far? Are we, is what's happening in the West, especially with deindustrialization and many different factors, uh, lowering of wages, capping of living standards, uh, are they experiencing what happened in the post-Soviet period, at least the, the working sections of the population, the working class sections of the population, or is that too extreme of an analogy? No, I, I think there are many uh, common elements, but I have to say I'm re not really an expert on it, but I've been delving into it because I think it's, 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 it's so fascinating. And, and there are parallels there. You know, when economies shrink, there are common elements. And, and the interesting thing what happened in 1848 was that uh, in, in, in Europe, uh, there was uh, 1846 was the repeal of the Corn Laws. Everybody agreed in free trade. And then you have a financial crisis in England in 1847, and you have a bad harvest in many European countries. And then suddenly in 1848, uh, David Ricardo and the free trade idea is attacked from all sides. You have three books in 1848. You have, um, you have Marx and Engels, the Communist Manifesto. Well, Marx was in favor of free trade under some circumstances because they said if free trade introduced too early, people will get poor and will get a revolution. So he was in favor of free trade in that sense. Yeah. And then you have Bruno Hildebrandt. You know, Marx had to flee to England because he was so radical. And then you have a German economist, Bruno Hildebrandt, who, who was kind of middle of the road. Well, he was so conservative, he had to flee to Switzerland in, in 1851. And then you have the great liberal, uh, John Stuart Mill, in 18, also in 1848, who says that all countries need what he called infant industry protection. You know, you don't send your children off to the labor market at the age of eight, you, you, you educate them. And this idea of infant industry argument really was what the rest of Europe industrialized on, on, on that idea. You know, Norway did, Sweden did, we all did. Uh, but the interesting thing is that here, free, at that point, free trade was attacked from the left and the right at the same time. Something similar happened in 1932, 1933, uh, Keynes wrote a paper on national self-sufficiency, let goods be homespun whenever reasonably possible, but above all, let banking be national. And then you have uh, uh, 2016, where, where both uh, Sanders and Trump, you know, both sides agree that free trade is no longer in the interest of the United States. And, and I think this is interesting, that it comes from the extremes. Uh, I mean, from, from, from the from the socialists and from the extreme right. I think this is, this, this, uh, this, this is a parallel. But of course, that Trump would say that in that situation is not that surprising. You know, when the leading nation of the world suddenly finds itself no longer being the leader, it will abolish free trade. You know, Holland was the leader until the big financial crisis in 1720, and by 1750, they, they started protecting their industry. England was the leader then up, up until the early 20th century, and then they gave up free trade, right? So, so that the, the leading nation gives up free trade is no surprise, it's just that it now happens to be the United States.
We have, uh, in 2008, was the biggest crisis of neoliberalism. Economic crash, banking crash, it took $20 trillion, I believe, just on the U.S. side to bail out the international banking system behind the scenes uh, without a public vote you know, by the Federal Reserve. Uh, so you had this utter massive failure. However, those set of ideas go on zombie style. Uh, they don't seem to die. Uh, so my question is, is it they don't die because they, they purely serve elite interests and the countries are obviously run by elites? Or is it because no matter how much we criticize neoliberalism, the alternatives are not credible enough? Uh, I mean, the alternatives would be state planning socialism or sort of a, a East Asian style state uh, directed capitalism. Do you, which one of these two do you think is the reason that these ideas don't die? Is it the, the surf elite interests or is it the alternatives are not viable? Well, I, I think it is essentially uh, vested interest and the lack of diversity in economics. You know, in, in for, for, for a long time you had English economics and then you had German economics and the United States uh, listened to the Germans and the Japanese listened to the Germans, so the latecomer would listen to the latecomers. Uh, and, and, and from, let's say, from Manchester liberalism on the right to communism on the left, there was a huge uh, continuum of, of options. So Yugoslavia had an option where they chose uh, uh, worker, you know, worker socialism, the workers own the factory. Sweden had the kind of the middle way or Scandinavia had the middle way. So I think um, that middle way uh, is, is, in my view, still, 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 the good, uh, still the best thing. You can pick ideas from both sides. So it was good to have that continuum. But then, at one point, one of the extremes, communism, di died and neoliberalism was the only game in town, right? And, and, and here is, I think, is where the Western interests uh, come in, that, you know, uh, continental economists had always distinguished between the financial sector and the real economy. That goes back to Hammurabi 1,500 years before Christ. Uh, you know, the, the, and it, you find it in the Bible all the time, you know, the perils of the mammon, dead capital which is not invested. And Marx had that, if you get to volume three in, in Das Kapital, uh, Schumpeter, who was a very conservative economist, had that. They all had it, except the English. So now we have an English-based economic theory which doesn't have this important distinction between, between the, f the finance and the real economy. I started my economic studies in, in Switzerland, and there I got the, the old German theory. Uh, and I published uh, recently a 600-page book on on German economic theory, but, but in a way it's the lack of alternative. On the other hand, it's, it, it was successfully in a sense patched up, uh, but at, a, at an enormous cost. But uh, I talk to this with my students every year and we have a movie showing the financial crisis and they all ask, well, nothing has happened since then. And this is a surprising thing, that with that crisis, Queen Elizabeth asking, you know, what went wrong, and, and, and the theory is still the same. So I think we, uh, unfortunately, we, we, we need a new financial crisis and, and I think it is reasonably close. And it's a bit like being in the earthquake business, you know, you know that this is an earthquake zone, but you, know ex you don't know exactly when, and, and, and this is a similar. It's actually case. more predictable than earthquakes. Uh, <laughs> is it fair to say that your profession has failed the world? I think so, because it, it, it went to a level of abstraction where context didn't matter. It's, it's, it, it's just like, well, if you're in the medical science, you have a set of medicines and you have diagnosis and you match the diagnosis to the context of the patient. But, but uh, neoclassical economics in this, in the New Yorker called it uh, triumphalism, you know, the age of triumphalism after the fall of the Berlin Wall, where, where neoclassical the end of economics, history, yeah. Yeah, th th that, was, that was the only game in town. I think this, they, we failed because we, 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 we didn't have a theory that matched uh, context to, to, to tools. One of the interesting things I read, there's an economist, and his last name is Wolf, I forget his first name in the United States, who said uh, economics is actually, if you, if you go to all the departments in a university, 
you know, if you're if you're in the biosciences, you're not discussing what was the pr primary thinking in the 18th century. It's it's <laughs> it's the only academic uh, endeavor in which it's a time warp uh, yeah. of, of a, you know it's prisoners of uh, dead ideas. And and it, and it's also the level of abstraction. You know, if you uh, if you're in, a, in in chemistry, the, the hydrogen atom doesn't wake up one morning and say, "I don't want to be hydrogen today. I want to be oxygen." Yeah. And 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 if you uh, the, the the desire of being a hard science, the the the, the physics envy of economics. Uh, did not allow for, you know, differences in human well, behavior. You know, you know, that might be possible in postmodern science, actually. Well, I, I, I made this, the, the, the claim that, that in, in a sense, economics is postmodern. <laughs> uh, I want to close with this. And uh, when you've watched uh, the transition, I mean, one of the problems, frankly, when the, the, the communist system failed or collapsed, there was no guidebook and how you make this transition anyway. Obviously, it was done in the worst possible ways, but there was no standard book of how you approach this. In fact, there was a lot more experience with the opposite. Yeah. Uh, but to what extent, and, and, and uh, that change was traumatic. I mean, you're looking at living standards, A, I mean, how many, when people die, linked to, I mean, it's just, it's atrocious in so many countries. Worse in other places still. Uh, how much do you think that was driven not by economics, however, it was driven by purely political considerations? And what came to my mind was, I remember reading something from Jeffrey Sachs, who was advising the government of Poland at the time, and he essentially says in so many words that the purpose was not to reform the economy at first. The purpose was to reform it in a way that the communist system cannot be reconstructed. Not that it was ever going to be reconstructed, but it was, it, was, it was a political endeavor. To what extent do you think that the harshness of this change was driven by uh, a political purpose rather than an economic purpose? And things were made worse because of it. I think you would find uh, Russian, some Russian intellectuals agreeing to that. And to some extent, I would also... I, I would also the, the shock therapy was was terrible. It was a lot of shock and very little therapy. That's right, and it was like primitive medicine. You know, you put the patient in hot water and then in cold water. Yeah. And, and, and well, I once heard uh, a group of Chinese scholars uh, discussing the transition with a group of Russian scholars, and it was interesting. And and the Chinese said that well, we survived because the Cultural Revolution had ruined the hierarchy, so it was already a decentralized system. So, so that the provinces and, and the cities and, and there was it's no chaos. central command. So, so, so uh, decisions became decentralized. So, so in, in a sense, it was, it, 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 the Inca Empire was taken over by a couple of hundred Spanish soldiers because if, when, they, when they beheaded the Inca and took you know, the, the top of the pyramid, the whole thing collapsed. And, and the collapse of, of, of the Soviet Union is not that different in, in a sense that because it was so centralized and it, and it took away the commanding heights and then the, it, 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 it collapsed. But it, clearly uh, uh, the, the shock therapy was, was in my view, a, 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 a crime. You know, we, sh we, should have known, we should have known better. You know, industrial production was cut by 50 percent, agricultural production by 50 percent, real wages by 50 percent, and the ruble went up. So, so how come that when the real economy collapses and, and, and the currency goes through the roof, you know, there's somebody manipulating this. There's somebody uh, who thinks that the economy is, is, is a stock market and there's some people who want to get their money out fast, and et cetera. So there, there, were, there were also uh, some Western advisors there. You mentioned Jeffrey Sachs and, and also others. I think uh, they, they, they were too harsh. Well, since your answers have been so interesting, I want to ask one last question. Uh, uh, speaking of the Soviet collapse, and given the fact that you're making analogies to the West, current and rough analogies, to what extent do you think the Soviet collapse was based on the fact that the elites, many of whom inherited the factories and the systems, uh, you know, their structures, but at the end of the day, without faith in your system, uh, 
you know, if you really don't believe the system can work, you just say, okay, to hell with it. You know, yeah. we, we, we let it go, especially if there's a financial incentive. I remember reading, uh, I think it was the head of the Stasi, Wolf, Marcus Wolf, I believe, who I think he said he, by 1970 he had figured out that the system is unworkable, mm -hmm. what they have. Do you think that the Eureka moment is going to come for the Western elite or it's not going to come because they own everything? Well, I think I'm optimistic because I feel there is a generational shift. You know, my generation uh, was extremely ideological. I, I was much less. But I feel that the new generation, also in the United States, are, are much more pragmatic. Well, if they call it socialism, well, call, let them call it what they want, you know. Uh, so I'm, I am optimistic there. But, but, but I think there is also an element of the to the hell with it argument, you know, people know that sooner or later Greece is not going to pay their debt. And, and, and they're shrinking the real economy to make it, to make it uh, able to pay the debt. So, so, and, and this is also happening in Italy. Uh, and this is clearly what's going to happen here and in, in, in Georgia. So, so I think from the point of view of the financial sector, they know that this is not going to last. But you know, we're making so much money by crushing this lemon for another year. So let's t do it one year at a time. And, and by the time they're, 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 they're finished crushing the lemon, you know, it can't grow back again. You know, that's, you know when industry is gone, it's very difficult to get it back. Um, you know, agriculture, um, uh, milk and meat production is pretty complicated. It's a family run thing. And w w once this is gone, it's, it, it's very difficult to get it back. You can get the poultry back, but, but, but uh, beef and milk, etc., is, is so much more complicated. And this irre irreversibility of things, you know, combined with, 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 with the, the lack of ethics of the financial sector, I think, is, 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 is awful. And behind that is, is the image that if we just let the market uh, work, uh, we have spontaneous order. I wrote a book called Spontaneous Chaos. It was also translated into Russian. And, and I think uh, sometimes the market would lead to, to, to chaos rather than to order. I don't think uh, you'll be teaching at the Chicago School anytime soon. No, I don't. <laughs> I don't but I, think so. I, I wanted to thank you uh, for this fantastic conversation. And it was a pleasure having you here. Well, thank you for having me.